So thank you kindly for the invitation to come and speak today. Uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, give a, a short update on, uh, uh, on, on hepatitis thrombocytopenia. So I'll, uh, I'll attempt to give a brief overview of what he uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is and its pathophysiology, um, focus a lot on the clinical approach and recognition of the diagnosis. This is really where the uh, importance of this condition comes to, um, and then talk a little bit about some treatment approaches and, and some updates uh, uh, of recent. So, um, Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia first comes with uh, heparin exposure. It's an, an atrogenic uh, adverse reaction to, to heparin that's, that's quite rare but important. Um, so when a patient's first exposed to heparin, uh, the body um, uh, forms a reaction to that and develops antibodies. Um, and it does that in combination with uh, circulating platelet factor four, which we all have circulating uh, in, uh, in our body. So the combination of the heparin and the, the platelet factor four um, is seen by an immune system and leads to an IgG uh, uh, antibody production. It's a bit of an odd antibody production because it doesn't go through the normal IgM and then class changed IgGs. And, and the um, time to development of IgG antibodies is about five to 10 days, which is much shorter than you see for other things. So there's lots of things about the why our immune system reacts to heparin and platelet factor four together that we don't fully understand, but we know that's what happens. Um, when heparin is continued or when the patient is uh, re-exposed to heparin at a later date, there's memory of those antibodies forming, and then the antibodies complex with the platelet factor four and the heparin itself. And it's the complex of all those factors together that are required to then attach to the uh, surface of platelets and lead to platelet activation. The clinical uh, consequences of that platelet activation is really thrombosis. So you, clinically you see thrombocytopenia because the platelets get cleared from the circulation. Um, but then the, the, the platelets become activated and do the things that the platelets are supposed to do that become sticky and then cause uh, uh, both arterial and venous thrombosis. And so even though the patient has thrombocytopenia, it really isn't a bleeding problem. What they, they present with is, 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 is thrombotic complications. Um, both arterial and venous thrombosis can be seen, but the, about four to one ratio. So, so venous thrombosis is the more predominant uh, clinical feature. There are other adverse uh, the clinical findings that are reported, um, local injection site reactions, systemic anaphylactic reactions to the heparin infusion itself. These are much uh, rarer uh, observed but, but are described and, and you probably have seen this as well. So just to highlight the, uh, the, 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 the thrombotic risk of these patients. Um, so this is an older study, but, but, but is actually what changed a lot of the decisions that we made. Just a cohort of a single center patients with confirmed hit over 14 years. And so 127 patients over 14 years just highlights the rare, how rare this condition is and how it takes time to follow these patients. So of all those patients, 50% had thrombosis at the time of diagnosis of HIT, um, uh, and uh, four times more likely to be a venous or deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or unusual site thrombosis is also seen compared to arterial events. And even of the 50% that didn't have thrombosis initially at diagnosis, um, I had about an additional 25%, uh, so 50% of those patients uh, developed a thrombosis during the next 30 days of, uh, of follow-up. And if you look here, um, in the first coming days, there's just a, a very high risk of developing thrombosis um, right after the diagnosis of HIT, even if they don't already have uh, a clot at the begin. And really, this is the rationale for um, anticoagulating these patients even in the present absence of a, a thrombotic event. It's to reduce the risk of developing a, a thrombosis associated with it. So clinically, when should you suspect HIT? Because as we all know, development of thrombocytopenia in hospitalized patients is incredibly common. Heparin use is also incredibly common, especially as a place like the Heart Institute where you use, use, use heparin for a lot of your, uh, a lot of your patients. Um, about five to 10 days after heparin exposure, if the patient didn't have a previous heparin exposure in the preceding three months, um, is when you should see the antibodies falling, uh, forming and the, the platelets falling. So if you're seeing um, a patient's platelet count dropping initially on the first one or two days, uh, and they've not had any heparin exposure in the preceding 100 days, then the probability of hit is much less likely. 
It causes thrombocytopenia, but not severe thrombocytopenia. So we see a 50% platelet drop, which for some people is going from 300 to 150. Um, if you're seeing severe thrombocytopenia, less than 30, less than 20, then, then the probability of being heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is a lot less likely. Um, and other causes like drug reactions or immune thrombocytopenia become a lot more common. It's unusual to fail anticoagulation and develop a thrombotic event despite being on heparin. And so when you see that, we always suspect uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and make sure we do a CBC if someone comes in with a, a, a thrombotic event on, anticoag on heparin anticoagulation. There's also certain higher risk populations that you should be a little bit more keen uh, to watch for. Surgical patients and trauma patients uh, have much higher incidence of hit when he with heparin exposure than the general medical patient uh, would. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's important to watch for. Um, and then the other thing is just no alternative explanation, because I think that really speaks to uh, the fact that thrombocytopenia is incredibly common, especially mild drops in, in the platelet count and not the severe thrombocytopenia. So as we all know, you know, it's not uncommon to have that situation where, where you know the platelets are dropping. Of course, the patient's on heparin. It could, could it be associated or not? So in terms of patient factors, uh, the use of unfractionated heparin is about 10 times higher associated with low molecular weight heparin than low molecular weight heparin. So it's quoted to be about 1% uh, for all patients who are exposed to low molecular weight heparin. Um, and 0.1% uh, for unfractionated heparin. Um, Surgical patients uh, more than medical patients, uh, and if they had the first exposure after the surgery versus the first exposure before the surgery. So what we think is going on is it's about optimizing the ratio of how much heparin and platelet factor four you have in order to make those right complexes. So if you have too much of one or the other, they don't quite bind together to have that, that three-way complex of the antibody, the platelet factor four, and the heparin. Um, and there's interesting things. So post cardiac surgery, for example, the development of the antibodies is actually quite common, but the proportion of those people who then go on to develop clinical hit and actually have platelet activation is, is actually very small uh, percentage wise. And so we think it's probably about this. So you get a huge heparin exposure on bypass and then less heparin afterwards. And maybe the ratios just don't add up for it to actually have clinical uh, development of the clinical syndrome. So in terms of making the diagnosis, um, we uh, do have a clinical prediction score called the 4T score, which I'm sure many people have heard of. In terms of the development of the clinical prediction score, this wasn't done in the most robust way. It was really on the back of an envelope. Um, what are the clinical features of HIT? Put them down, assign points, uh, and then apply it. Um, but despite that, it, it, it's been around for many years and has been shown to be effective at being able to discriminate between people who are more or less likely to have HIT. And so um, I think is of clinical usefulness. Um, and if nothing else, it's a reminder of what HIT is. And so you can remember the, how to diagnose HIT just by, by remembering the four Ts. Um, so it looks at the thrombocytopenia, and in particular, um, how much, so if it's less than 20, it's less likely to be hit. Um, if it's, uh, uh, you know, that the fall is smaller, less than 30% from the patient's pre-heparin baseline, then it's less likely to be hit. But if you have the classic 50% and, and the nadir is greater than 20, then you get your full two points. The timing between um, 10 and, uh, so, sorry, five and 10 days uh, would give you your full points. Or if you've had recent heparin exposure and it, the, the fall is within 24 hours, then that's the classic uh, presentation for HIT. The presence of thrombosis um, and the absence of an other cause. So they cheat and use the second T there. Um, and that one's very subjective, obviously. And, uh, um, you know, they do give some, some criteria for a definitive uh, or a possible, because many patients have a few medications that potentially could cause the rhabdocytopenia and other things going on. So as I say, it's, um, it's, it's, it's probably not the most, most robust developed uh, uh, clinical prediction score, but does seem to have utility and has good sensitivity in, um, uh, for uh, at least a low 4T score. So from a laboratory perspective, um, 
uh, we have uh, two main types of, of, of tests that we use. So there, there's the immunological test, which is just purely testing for the presence of the antibodies, and then the functional test, which tests for the ability of those antibodies to activate platelets. Um, so here in the Ottawa Hospital and the Heart Institute, we use an ELISA-based uh, assay, and we use a polyspecific, so we can actually measure IgM or IgG uh, antibodies, um, uh, and you don't get a report. It, it, it's sensitive to both of them. Um, Functional tests are really looking for, for the platelets to be doing something in the presence of, of heparin and uh, in the, in the patient's uh, serum. Uh, and so um, the most classic one is, is the release of radioactive labeled serotonin, and that would be your serotonin release assay. Um, we in all, here do a LUMO agronomity uh, test for ATP release. So it's similar concept. It's a wash platelet assay, but it doesn't require radioactive labeling. Um, and it's less widely used, so it's important to know that our functional test is not the SRA that you're reading about as much. Um, in Europe, a heparin-induced platelet activation test it, it tends to be a more common test, but they're all the same concept. They're, they're measuring the, the ability of those antibodies to activate platelets. So in terms of a diagnostic approach, if you have a patient that you're suspecting hit, I think it's reasonable to apply the, the 4T score. If you have a low clinical probability, then the chances of having hit is very low, less than 1%. Um, and the recommendations are that you can continue heparin and, and actually not even do the, any additional testing. If you have an intermediate or high probability score, which unfortunately most of your patients will fall into, then the recommendation is to immediately discontinue heparin and start a non-heparin anticoagulant. You then attain an immunoassay, which is easily available. The ELISA base are done daily in most hospitals, so at least here we, we have the luxury of that. If that is positive by your defined threshold, and we'll talk about the ILX on the next slide, um, then you continue to avoid heparin, you continue your non-heparin anticoagulation, and you wait for your functional assay, which should be used to confirm in the presence of a good uh, presentation in history. If your immunoassay is negative, then your patient is very unlikely to have hit, and then you can restart the heparin or continue it depending on where you are. So as I say, the ELISA-based um, screening assay is the most common you used. The reported units are in optical density, um, and the threshold is typically 0 0.4, which is set by most kits uh, manufacturers. Unfortunately, that's based on healthy volunteers uh, who didn't have heparin exposure, uh, and it means that we get a lot of 0 0.4 or 1, 0 0.45 uh, results back. Uh, and we do know that the likelihood of hit increases the higher that optical density value. And a lot of people would argue that probably that cutoff should be 1, and we reduce the number of people that we have sitting around on um, higher risk anticoagulant, uh, non-heparin anticoagulants waiting for the functional test to come back. Because of all the people we suspect of having hit, probably between 7 and 10% of them will actually have hit confirmed. So this 90% of these patients are being changed from their heparin, which they were on for a reason, put on argaxaban or a non-heparin anticoagulation, having bleeding complications, and don't actually have the condition to begin with. So here um, in Ottawa, we do have one clinical trial, which is looking at um, combining the 4T score in a, a, a stratified cutoff of that ELISA test. So a patients with a lower intermediate 4T score can um, have a, their uh, cutoff changed to either one or two, uh, depending, uh, and if it's less than one, we exclude hit and continue heparin. If it's greater than two, we feel pretty confident that probably is hit with out even waiting for that functional test so you can move on with your management of your patients and then the people in between the numbers just don't quite add a, a, give you a strong one way or the other so we do still do the functional testing in the high pretest probability scores because those, those people at a baseline just on the 4t score would have about a 50 percent chance of having a hit then we use one as a, as a cutoff so once you get to uh, greater than one then you can reasonable to say that these patients are much likely to have a hit and you can just go on and make the diagnosis, manage the patient and, and move on with, with the rest of their care and discharge. So what are the treatment options in a patient that you're suspecting hit in? Um, so the first thing is, of course, stopping the heparin and starting a non-heparin uh, alternative. Um, but unfortunately, stopping the heparin is not enough. As we saw from that uh, historic study, uh, the ongoing thrombotic rate in these patients is quite high, um, and they have about a 50% risk of thrombosis, even in a patient who doesn't have a clot, within the next 30 days. So it's important to start that non-heparin alternative medication. 
The main two treatment options that, that we use uh, uh, parentally, at, at least, uh, are agachaban and dinaprenoid. Um, so agachaban, which is probably what you've seen mostly used, um, is a direct thrombin inhibitor, but an intravenous uh, one. It therefore affects the PTT and the INR, and we, we titrate the dose by the PTT to keep it between 1.5 and, and 3 uh, times the upper limits of normal, so 45 to 90. Um, it needs caution and dose reduction in people with hepatic failure, heart failure, or ICU patients, and post-cardiac surgery patients. So many of your patients um, uh, will have higher bleeding risk on this medication. Um, we have uh, protocols for the dosing, which has helped a lot, and, and, and we recommend starting with the low-dose uh, bolus and adjustments in, in the higher-risk patients. Dineprenoid has been used for many years for treatment of HID. It came off the market in Canada just because of the availability by the producers, the drug company. It was nothing wrong with the medication. It's now um, been uh, picked up by another company and is, is widely available, but um, less commonly used just because we fell out of favor of using it, I think, for more than anything. Um, it's a low molecular weight heparinoid, so it's not a heparin, but works in a similar action. Um, and an anti 10 a assay, just like your heparin, um, is how you would adjust it. It doesn't actually require 10 a monitoring. You can, it's, it's weight-based dose like you do a low molecular weight heparin, but we do do some screening uh, at least on day two or three or any changes in the patient to, to watch for the 10A activity and adjust the dose. Um, uh, and I think it's important to highlight that we do, we are about to open an industry-sponsored uh, uh, open-label randomized trial comparing these two medications head-to-head, -head, um, at least at the general campus, and maybe at some point it might come over here uh, just to, to see if there is a difference uh, between these two medications. So other treatment options, uh, Fondaparinux uh, is a very conveniently administered medication that can be given as a sub-Q daily injection, so patients can actually be discharged home on this medication if they're otherwise well. Um, it's really cleared and has a long half-life, and so in the acute phase, we, 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 we use it less. Um, Bivalarudin is a medication that you uh, here are probably much more experienced with. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a synthetic peptide. It's given intravenously, um, and it, it's been studied and, and, and effective in the use of a, a HIT. It's quite expensive, but I think that's the main limitation to its use, especially since we have other alternatives available. But in unique situations, especially people who require urgent uh, cardiac uh, um, uh, procedures or vascular surgeries who really need to have a, a, an intravenous uh, short-acting medication, um, it, it, it's, it's the go-to medication in that situation. And then, of course, um, we have the direct oral anticoagulants. And so if you think about it, they're, they're non-heparin medications. They're much easier to use, and we have a lot of experience using them in thrombotic conditions, and they're very inexpensive. Um, and so uh, the most recent uh, update of the American Society of Hematology guidelines actually come out and make a statement about this and say that they give a conditional weak recommendation for the treatment, although all of the treatments I just mentioned had a conditional weak recommendation. It's a rare disease that hasn't been studied well, so um, uh, it, there's limitations there. Um, so just to talk a little bit about that, um, and it's something that, that is you know, coming to, to people's mind in the HIT world. Um, so the most experience we have is with rivaroxaban, and that's because we did have one Canadian um, uh, cohort study that uh, used uh, rivaroxaban uh, in patients with uh, suspected and confirmed HIT. Um, it's given, so for, for venous thrombosis, we start with a 15 milligrams twice a day for the first three weeks for a, a new venous thrombotic event. And in the study, they chose a protocol of 15 milligrams twice a day until the platelets recover. And it's thought that that's when the antibodies are less prevalent and, and active in that situation. Unfortunately, they only enrolled 22 patients over two years, and only 10 of them had confirmed HIT. So that's all we have in terms of an objective thing. And you can imagine how selected those patients were. Um, Adding to that, there's a case series from Hamilton of their experience with uh, just outside of a clinical trial use of, uh, of rivaroxaban and other DOAX in the setting of HIT. And so we have 46 patients published in the literature. Um, although again, if you look back and haul, dust off the old studies for agachaban and dinaprenoid, you're not seeing thousands of patients used. You're having 100 or less patients in most of those studies. Um, so what we know to date is that there was one thrombotic event in those 46 patients that happened in one of the patients in, this, in the uh, study, um, and that led to a 2% um, on-treatment thrombotic rate uh, within 30 days, uh, and there was no major hemorrhage reported. Obviously, very selective patients, um, but me mechanistically, it's a non heparin medication that's very convenient and safe to use, and, 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 and I think we'll see more about this in the future.
So the um, suggestions are, and I, and I think I would agree with this, if you have a patient who's critically ill, increased risk of bleeding, um, or potentially needs urgent procedure, then you want a parental short-acting medication. So agactroban or bavalarudin, if it's a cardiac procedure that's happening, would be your preferred option. If the patient's clinically stable and not at a high risk of bleeding, the renal function's uh, reasonable, um, then Fondaparinox uh, is, is a reasonable option, or you might consider using a direct oral anticoagulant um, because of the ease of administrations and whatnot. If you have a patient who has a, li uh, a very severe thrombotic complications, they've got a you know a terrible life or limb threatening thrombotic event, um, then I personally would be very uncomfortable having that be my first patient or second patient with using a direct oral anticoagulant, given the the the, the very little evidence to support it. Um, and I think a gastroban, bivalvumin, denapinor, or fondaparinox, where there is a little bit more historical experience, would be a, a more appropriate treatment. Um, if a patient has a severe hepatic dysfunction, then you do have to be careful with agactroban. You may want to choose uh, one of the other medications. And, and Dorex would also be contraindicated. So you'd be looking at denaprenoid or fondaparinux uh, in that situation. In patients who aren't treated with a DOAC, eventually they will have to be transitioned to warfarin if, if, if uh, HIT is confirmed. Um, we do worry about, again, it's such a prothrombotic state, and we know that heparin has a prothrombotic tendency for the first five days. Um, so we start, uh, we wait until the platelets normalize so that we think the thrombotic risk is lower when the platelets normalize, and we start with a lower dose instead of giving the 10 milligram primer, we start with a lower dose. And of course, with your, an overlap with your parental uh, therapy initially. If you have isolated HIT without a thrombotic complication, um, then by those historic curves, it looks like the risk of thrombosis for two to four weeks, even after stopping heparin persists. Um, and so one month duration anticoagulation is recommended. Um, if HIT is associated with a thrombotic event, then we t typically uh, treat that for three months, which is what we do for most other provoked uh, thrombotic complications, um, but really just borrowed from there as opposed to being <coughs> evidence-based. So um, I, I'm happy to take any questions. And then just to summarize, you know, I think from a, a clinical perspective, the 4T score and um, using that to guide the interpretation of the optical density would be suggested and the importance of uh, avoiding heparin in the future in these patients. <coughs>